good evening everybody it's a proud moment to introduce my friend and colleague k asok vardhan sethi he is a most of you know about him k asok vardhan sethi is a former vice chancellor of the indian maritime university chennai a central university under the ministry of shipping before assuming charge of first vice chancellor he was the member of indian administrative service tamil nadu cadre of the 83 batch prior to his retirement from ias he held a number of key assignments in fact he took a voluntary retirement as i am including registrar university madras director of college of education district collector vilupuram director of rural development chief minister secretariat principal secretary rural development panchayat raj department principal secretary municipal administration water supply and among other thing and he was also in the department of archaeology in the very same building where we are right now uh, this assembled for this meeting he was holding his office once here he has published several articles on public administration management e government popular science popular mathematics in leading english and tamil publication such as the hindu the hindu center for politics and public policy the hindu tamil the hindu sun times indian express the hindu business line deccan herald deccan chronicle times of india and science today now defined today he will be talking about the rethinking indian cities which will address issues coping with urban sprawl water scarcity degraded rivers urban flooding and other challenges in the age of climate change this much is the formal introduction but i can't afford to only that in i am a close follower of his writing i think uh, for many many years uh, whatever wherever he writes i i do get a copy and i always respond so we hold him in high esteem because of a uh, original thinker and also a civil servant which is uh, which is basically applying his learning and then sharing with others also and uh, i have actually when in in 90s uh, when i used to when i visited vilupuram to one of my relatives house this old an officer's thing i was uh, there for a half a day for a lunch during the discussion all my relatives and friends they were one common topic is their collector they were all talking about i was trying to recall which year i was just asking him they were talking about their collector like a trophy <laughs> say the our collector our collector like that so then i heard that name at that time itself if some people that the people are the clients for civil servants if the clients are satisfied and they are talking about that particular civil servant as of their own in our collector that ownership and that celebration is a thing is a that is actually the what you call the confidential report which is written in open that is what we work for i often say that if i have a, i don't believe in next birth if i have to restart my life in person i will again study, study tamil literature b and ma again again i will sit down for civil service exam i'll go to any cadre which is allotted to me like that so this particular service is uh, proud of him we have seen him in many assignment the way he writes and then relates the thing and particularly today's topic is very very relevant this very building was affected by the recent flood for which now we have changed our entire concept we are going to demolish this building we are shifting for a temporarily and going for a new building to make it flood proof and then uh, and more importantly topically we are rethinking indian cities to me in this building it sounds so irony and we didn't even know till 1924 we had said 2024 is the 100th year of indus civilization announcement by john marshall till 100 years back we were not even knowing that uh, we are a, we are a owner to the some of the urban civilization 5000 year back so the second urbanization we were talking about the gangetic valley so today we are rethinking rather i i it's so ironical that india which had its mohenjodara and harappa and the urban literature par excellence in the form of science sangam literature right now we are thinking about is an urban city because that in the uh, human development index the level of urbanization is one of the reliable and key indicator tamil nadu is always in the forefront of urbanization we are very eager to Uh, waiting to listen to you, Mr. Sokotan Sati. Once again, on behalf of our moral, I take an at my personal level also take great pride in inviting you to give a talk. Thank you much. Thank you, sir. As other kumbhu sirup sirup se yeh naram guru ne rakhe, guru ne rakhe sirup se yeh much varu shender mulu variyum aur mulu maya avargalay alikiron.
நன்றி ஐயா குட் ஈவினிங் லேடிஸ் அண்ட் ஜென்டில்மேன் கிளியர் த லேட் அமெரிக்கன் ரைட்டர் டேவிட் ஃபாஸ்டர் வெலஸ் ஒன் செட் த மோஸ்ட் ஆப்வியஸ் உபிக்விட்டஸ் and important realities are often the ones hardest to see and talk about one such obvious ubiquitous and important reality facing us today is the runaway growth and impending systemic collapse of our mega cities unless we do something about it for example delhi and bangalore have expanded by more than 3 times over the last 30 years swamped by migrations from their hinterland areas mumbai kolkata and chennai are not far behind what is scary is that these mega cities may expand by another three times over the next 30 years are we prepared for it that's the question a recent who survey of air pollution in 7800 cities across 134 countries revealed that of the 100 most polluted cities in the world 83 were in india 83 out of 100 unexpected and uncontrolled urbanization has created several other problems that you all know of slums poor sanitation flooding water scarcity degraded rivers transportation failure and rapidly depleting open spaces and green spaces these problems daunting as they are have been compounded by climate change climate change is a very mild expression i am surprised why they are using that it should actually be called climate crisis for reasons which i will explain shortly if you want to understand the kind of economic misery and loss of life that climate change can potentially cause just look back to covid-19 epidemic then imagine the same damage happening over a much longer period possibly decades as in the case of covid-19 it's always the poorer countries and the poorer sections of the society who will be most affected by climate change managing the problems arising from rapid urbanization in an age of climate change and making your cities sustainable or at least survivable is the biggest challenge before the government this is the subject of my talk the legendary investor warren buffett once said investing is simple but not easy what he meant was there are certain things in life which are simple in theory but difficult in practice investing is one of them playing cricket or golf is another losing weight is a third example i know all about dieting and exercise but as you can see from my size and shape i am not good at practicing them what i am going to say in my talk today is not quantum physics or rocket mechanics most of the points are very simple in theory but they are extremely difficult to implement they call for clear political vision long term planning steadfast efforts effective enforcement of regulations and continuous education to modify public behavior in our government setup all these things are very difficult you may have noticed that i did not mention finance having worked in government for many decades i believe that the problem with government is not paucity of resources it is misapplication of resources of throwing good money after bad schemes in any case when the very survival of our cities and our civilization is at stake finance should be the least constraint one of the least constraints liberal external aid for city development and climate change initiatives can always be obtained is climate change for real there's a saying in english past behavior is the best predictor of future behavior this applies to the planet earth also the earth's climate has changed several times 
in the past as it went through ice ages and warm interglacial periods so you can expect it to happen again you are probably aware of this story if you put some frogs into a kettle of boiling water they will leap out immediately but if you put the same frogs in a kettle of water at room temperature and heat the water slowly to boiling point the frogs will remain in the water and die our thinking with regard to climate change is somewhat similar we are blind creeping dangers i assume that all of you know what the greenhouse effect is and why the earth is warming carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide and fluorinated gases used in refrigerators and air conditioners are the greenhouse gases responsible for global warming cot is the biggest culprit as you can see it contributes to 76% of greenhouse gas emissions nearly every human activity burning fossil fuels like coal oil and natural gas in industrial processes and transportation felling trees rearing cattle and other livestock growing paddy and other agricultural crops constructing buildings and roads dumping organic waste in landfills nearly everything we do emits one or the other of these greenhouse gases what is worse they stay in the atmosphere for several decades and even centuries for example once emitted 40% of carbon dioxide still remains after 100 years 20% still remains after 1000 years 10% still remains after 10000 years so the carb about 20% of the carbon dioxide breathed out by raja raja cholan is still there somewhere around methane nitrous oxide and f gases are more potent than carbon dioxide but they have a much shorter atmospheric lifetime just a few decades climate scientists use the term co2 equivalent so that you know you take all the club all the gases together or just co2 emissions the equivalence is assumed as i mentioned here every year about 51 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions are emitted into the atmosphere every year year after year if we are going to avoid a climate disaster then we have to reach net zero co2 emissions by 2050 in other words we must minimize co2 emissions as much as possible and whatever remains must be absorbed and stored the technical term for this is sequestration of carbon remember that during covid-19 when all life seemed to and all life and all economic activity seemed to come to a standstill the drop in co2 emissions was just 5 to 10% it was still 46 to 48 billion tons of co2 so going to net zero by 2050 is going to be extremely difficult without sacrificing our economic development india has committed to reach this goal by 2070 we have been given 20 years grace time now this is a famous graph it's called the keeling curve there are many famous equations and graphs in science one is e is equal to mc squared of einstein another is the bell curve or the normal distribution curve in statistics the keeling curve measures the carbon dioxide concentration year after year a scientist called david keeling did this in, a, in an observatory in hawaii and he faithfully kept records and he found that the carbon dioxide concentration was steadily going up you know this was the first time that scientists realized that there is a problem oh, sorry then scientists started looking backwards they looked backward for 2000 years and they found that the earth's carbon dioxide concentration was fairly steady to about 1850 and then it started going up you know why around 1850 18 19th century the industrial revolution happened then internal combustion engines were 
you know, invented, which run on you know petrol and diesel, and were used in cars, buses, ships, airplanes, everything. So there is a sudden spike in the carbon dioxide emissions from 1850 onwards, and more so after 1960. Sorry, I'm getting confused. <laughs> Then scientists went back further, four lakh years. You know, they have the techniques for finding the carbon dioxide concentrations in, hidden in the ice cores and all that. And they found that there's a clear correlation between the carbon dioxide concentration and the mean temperature of the Earth. Every time the carbon dioxide concentration went up, the Earth's temperature went up. Every time it went down, the Earth's temperature went down. And as you can see in the right, currently the carbon dioxide concentration is far, far above anything that was there in the last four lakh years. We are now into uncharted territory. Now, here, scientists have tried to project as to what the temperature increase will be if things continue as usual around 2100 BC. They have projected that it will be somewhere between 3.3 .3 degrees Celsius and 5.7 degree Celsius. The goal is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050 and bring it down thereafter. Of particular concern are tipping points. You know what are tipping points? Things do not happen gradually. They will happen, suddenly there will be a change and there may be a precipitous drop. Climate change is expected to cause more extreme weather events, more intense heat waves and wildfires, more violent storms, more floods and droughts, more crop failures. On December 1st, 2015, when we had that major flood, 25% of Chennai's annual rainfall of 1,400 millimeters fell on just one day. 25% of the rain fell on one day. So what is happening now is rains are, you know, intense storms, intense rainfall, but spread out. That's what is happening. Climate change is expected to cause rising sea levels and acidification of the oceans. As you know, when something is heated, it expands. When the ocean water is, becomes warmer, it is going to expand. And when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, you get carbonic acid, which is acidic. That's going to dissolve the coral reefs and the shells of sea creatures, which can have unpredictable effects. City, coastal cities are particularly vulnerable. Chennai is a coastal city. And most of the great cities of the world are coastal cities. Greenhouses are a global externality, a double free riding problem, free riding on you know, OC. I mean, some countries will, will implement costly measures, others will free ride on their efforts. The present generation may free ride on the efforts of the, uh, on the future generations. Mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation means we must make efforts to mitigate the impact of climate change. Adaptation, to use, to give an example, there's a saying, if rape is inevitable, lie down and enjoy it. So some people say there's no way we are going to solve this climate change problem. We have to face it. I mean, there is going to be desertification. There's going to be mass migration. Maybe Siberia will become warm and people may have to migrate to Siberia. I don't think Russians will allow it, but I'm saying that people say we have to adapt. So this is an excellent book. I suggest that you read it. It gives lists 100 measures, covers almost the entire gamut of measures needed to deal with climate change. Now, our friend Irene Bu here was often fond of saying, if you don't take hard decisions now, you'll have to take harder decisions later. This is very true of climate change. If you don't take effective decisions and now, you'll have to take harder decisions and costly decisions later. Powerful lobbies within countries can thwart measures. As you know, the previous president US, uh, of US Trump, Donald Trump, was against this. And you may know the story of the tobacco lobby and the cigarette companies. Even though it was known way back in the 1950s that there is a clear link between tobacco smoking and cancer and a host of other diseases, the tobacco lobby successfully thwarted all regulatory attempts for about 40 to 50 years. They engage scientists, unscrupulous scientists, who would, you know, write 
the counter. The idea was if you can't convince, then confuse. That was the whole idea. Now, the same thing is happening in climate change also. Only difference here is almost every industry is involved here. So the resistance is going to be greater. Now, many of us think that climate change is a problem to be solved by the central government. We think that the generation of more solar power and wind power, the development of better electric batteries or other systems of storage, the adoption of electric vehicles, the use of green hydrogen and green ammonia as industrial fuels, the adoption of LED lights and other energy efficient devices, the levy of a carbon tax or the implementation of a cap and trade carbon permits can help us reach net zero by 2070. All these measures are necessary, but they are not sufficient. The real battle for climate change will be waged not in Delhi, but in all our cities. That's where the war is going to be fought. How our cities are planned, how they are designed, and how they grow is going to play a critical role in our ability to fight climate change. And this is the subject of my talk. Oh, sorry. Okay. Can you tell me, something happened on May 23, 2007. Something very momentous happened. Can anybody tell me what happened? Very good. On that day, for the first time in human history, the world's urban population exceeded the rural population. And more people started living in cities than in villages. Now, the 20th century has been called the urban century. Humanity is adding an urban area the size of New York City every month. Global urban population is expected to cross two-thirds by 2050. And as you know, cities are where all the action is. They contribute the bulk of a nation's GDP, employment, commerce, innovation. They consume 80% of the world's energy and produce 75% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. Now, about the problems of cities, I've told you already. One of, these, one of the problems which most of us are not aware of is the problem of slums. Globally, 25% of the people live in slums. In India, it is 49%. In Mumbai, it is 55%. Now, this is an interesting study done in Europe in offices. They found that 42% of European office employees had no natural light in their working environment. 55% had no access to any greenery. 7% had no windows in their workplace. Now, this is the case in Europe. You can well imagine what the situation will be in our offices. The noise, crowds, unnatural lighting, rapid shrinking of green and open spaces, and alienation cause an urban psychological penalty. Many people are not aware of this. Living in cities actually causes mental problems, mental health problems. It has been proven. It's not I mean, a joke. So the next time you are annoyed with your friend or a spouse or relatives, don't blame them. Blame the city. Okay. Now, India's urban population was 31% as per the 2011 census. And now it's estimated to be 36%. You can see the urban populations of other countries. China is 64%. Russia is 75%. Brazil is 88%. Japan is 92%. Now, my question is this. If we are having so many problems when the urban population percentage is only 36%, what will happen when it becomes 50%, 75%, 90%? Because even though it is 36%, in terms of absolute numbers, we have a huge urban population, second only to China. But at the rate at which our urban population is growing, we are going to face a real problem. India's urban population is expected to cross 50% by 2050. After that, Mahatma Gandhi's statement that India lives in its villages will no longer be true. The three states, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Maharashtra, were close to 50% even in 2011. I'm sure they would have all crossed 50% by now. Now, there are two patterns of urbanization in India. 
One is dispersed urbanization, other is concentrated urbanization. Dispersed urbanization, you are apart from the capital city or several other cities which are decent, which are reasonably big. In concentrated urbanization, only the capital city is very big, the other cities are much smaller relative to it. For example, if you compare the population, if you compute the ratio of the capital city and the second biggest city, in Tamil Nadu, the ratio of Chennai and Coimbatore is forged to 1. In Kerala, Trivandrum and Cochin, the ratio is 1.7 to 1. In Mumbai, sorry, in Maharashtra, the ratio of Mumbai and Pune is 3.7 to 1. These are states with dispersed urbanization. There are several big cities apart from the capital cities. Whereas in Karnataka, the ratio of Bangalore's population and Mysore's population is 8.5 to 1. In Telangana, Hyderabad is to Warangal, 15.5 is to 1. In West Bengal, Kolkata is, is to Asansol, the second biggest city, is 11.7 is to 1. Needless to say, dispersed urbanization is better than concentrated urbanization. Now, there are three terms which you should know. Tier 1 cities, whose population is more than 1 lakh. Metropolitan cities, whose population is more than 10 lakhs. Strictly speaking, it's an area. And mega cities whose population is more than 10, 100 lakhs or 1 crore. Now, India's urban population is concentrated mostly in these cities, tier 1, metropolitan, and mega cities. The tier 2 to tier 6 and villages are all being hollowed out. You know, people are migrating from them to the bigger cities. In 1965, there are only two mega cities in the world, New York and Tokyo. In 2023, there were 45 mega cities. Mega cities are cities with a population more than 1 crore. Most of them are in Asia, five are in India. You can see the graph. Tokyo is 40.8 crores, sorry, a million, 40.8 million. Shanghai, Delhi, Jakarta, Chennai comes last, 12.2. Five Indian cities figure in this, and I'm sure very soon Hyderabad and Ahmedabad also will be added to the list. Now, it is not just. In our cities, Karachi in Pakistan, Dhaka in, West Bang in Bangladesh, Manila in Philippines, Jakarta in Indonesia, Bangkok in, in Thailand, Beijing in Shanghai in China, all have grown like anything. They've all expanded by three to five times over the last 30 years. They've grown haphazardly and unexpectedly. So this is a famous quotation from Patrick Bingham Hall, a city planner and architect. He says, Asian megacities grew so rapidly and unexpectedly that governments and urban planners could only play catch-up. Unless something is done quickly, the most predictable crisis facing 21st century civilization is the descent Asian megacities into a state of potentially terminal dysfunction. So it is not just an Indian problem, it's an Asian problem. So this is the aerial view of Shanghai city. How would you administer a city like this? And Shanghai is next to four or three or four other cities, you know, Nanjing, Hangzhou, Suzhou, and literally the population is about 10 crores, and you have to manage this. Urban neglect. Now, in India, local government is a state subject under the constitution. Till 2005, India's political system was heavily biased towards the rural sector. But then there is a clear neglect of the rural sector. The cities, the low, urban local bodies were left to fend for themselves. Urban local bodies had few schemes or function-specific grants. Many were lacking in finances and institutional capacity. Even though I think many are lacking in finances, they are barely able to pay their salaries, barely able to pay the pensions. There has been some course correction and sharper urban focus since 2005. After the Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission, JNNURF, there has been some course correction to the first major scheme for urban areas, whereas the rural department had several schemes, you know, since independence. In 2011, Manmohan Singh government appointed a high power committee to assess how much funds would be needed to rejuvenate our 
um, to create and renew India's urban infrastructure over a 20 year period from 2012 to 2032. They came up with a figure of 40 lakh crores for 20 years or 2 lakh crores per year. This is the amount you have to spend to keep our cities in top shape. But the total funds allocated since 2015 for urban development schemes like Smart Cities Mission, Amrut, Swachh Bharat Mission Urban are less than 6 lakh crores. All these years, since 2015, they have not allocated even 6 lakh crores. Mm -hmm. Government of India's point is, you don't have the capacity to spend even the small money that we are giving you. So, though the money is inadequate, we don't have the capacity to spend even this low level of funding. So, along with greater infrastructure funding, institutional reforms are necessary. I think we need to seriously reform urban governance. We need to create more posts, create maybe a district urban development agency in each district, whatever. And we should stop creating more and more districts. I think they're becoming too small. And we need to seriously do something about cities. Policy makers in the states and center are yet to come to grips with the seriousness of the problems. I personally think that our political leaders at all levels have not understood the seriousness of the problem. Unmanaged urban growth. Now, city planning is a topic of great interest abroad. People take a lot of interest in the way the city develops, how the city is planned. But in India, though we appreciate beautifully planned cities like New Delhi or Chandigarh or whatever, we don't seem to much about city planning. As you know, most Indian cities are old and grew organically. We have only a handful of planned cities. Most of them have grown haphazardly. Some mega cities and metropolitan cities draw up a master plan that is a framework for the future growth of a city for 10 to 20 years. But master planning is usually confined to zoning. It does not include key areas such as urban infrastructure, transportation, and environment. Creation of new blue and green infrastructure and conservation of existing ones are given little or no priority. For example, the Amrut Atal Mission for Urban Rejuvenation and Transformation. Only 2% of the funds, first of all, the amount is not enough, 1 lakh crores. Only 2% of the funds is allocated for parks and gardens. And in operation of Chennai, there are 350 engineers and only three horticulturists. That shows the importance given to grey infrastructure and green infrastructure. I suppose all of you know what floor space index FSI is. It's the ratio of the built-up area to the plot area. The higher the FSI, the greater the floor area that can be built on a plot of land. Higher FSI imposes greater infrastructure load on ULB on the urban local body to increase demand for drinking water, sewerage, solid waste management, and increased vehicular traffic. You can't endlessly go on increasing FSI. Where there is one building, it is demolished, and if you put up an apartment complex of, say, six apartments, the water supply requirement will become 6x, the sewage outgo will become 6x, the, water, the traffic you know, in terms of cars will become 6x, the pipes on the road may not have the capacity to carry this kind of load. Even if you replace those pipes on that road, the pipes upstream and downstream may not be in a position to handle. So there are a lot of problems. You know. The road width is a constraint on permissible FSI. Given the low widths of city roads and inadequate municipal infrastructure, most Indian cities permit low FSI 1 to 2. With low FSI, High-rise, high-density urban land use is not feasible. This leads to urban sprawl. Because our cities are old and unplanned, the roads are narrow. Because the roads are narrow, you can't give high FSI. Because you don't have high FSI, you can't go beyond you know, a certain number of flows. So, urban sprawl, that is, a city can only spread horizontally, not vertically. Now, in 2010, I played a, a role in the expansion of Chennai city from 176 square kilometers to 426 square kilometers. And 17 other cities, mostly capital cities in the state, Coimbatore, we expanded it from 115 square kilometers to 265 square kilometers. Madurai from 49 square kilometers to 52, 152 square kilometers. Even Madurai high quarters in a village, Punchai. And almost every capital city, every district headquarters, sorry, every district headquarters, we expanded the boundaries. 
At that time, I was quite proud of it. Also, I extend, expanded it from 11 square kilometers, which was which it was when I was subcontractor in 1985. It was still 11 square kilometers in 2010 when I became municipal Mission secretary. Expanded also from 11 square kilometers to 83 square kilometers. At that time, I was quite proud of it. But now I realize that while this expansion must be done, but these added areas are even worse than the core city because CMD regulations are very liberal for the, I mean, added areas because they were previously villages or small towns. So you don't have wide roads and they're even worse than the core city. And so things are becoming worse and worse. I hope you get my point. Whereas in 60s and 70s, they planned a series of layouts, Annanagar, this Nagar, that Nagar and all that. Now we have stopped doing it. We have just allowed things to take their own, this one. With the result, you find that the added areas are worse than the core city. I was vice chancellor in Indian Maritime University in Uthandi. And but as long as I was there, till 2017, the water connection and sewerage connection had not been given. So I had to pay some 1.6 crore specially to Metro water to play a separate line for me. And to my knowledge, sewerage connection is yet to be given in the added areas. If we do not plan greenfield satellite cities, rethink our current city planning template and regenerate existing cities where feasible, our overloaded mega cities and metropolitan cities will be at risk of systemic collapse. How and why city design matters. As I said already, battle against climate change will be won or lost in our cities. Now, there are five very important aspects as regards climate change, but they also are important from other aspects. First, what is the city's spatial form? Is it a sprawling city or is it a dense high-rise city? Second, how people move around? Private automobiles? versus public transport, cycling, and walking. Third, how the city's buildings are designed, constructed, and operated. Is the city mired in energy guzzling, artificially lighted, heated, and cooled buildings, built with materials having high carbon footprint? How biophilic the city is. Biophilia means love of nature. How much green cover it has, and its approach towards nature-based solutions. I'll explain each of them later. How circular the city's economy is, how effectively it recycles or reuses solid waste and liquid waste or recovers useful materials from them. So each of these points is important. This is the vision of a climate resilient city. It must grow vertical. It must be high density. Now, if it's high density, it's not likely to be sociable. So you must make it a high amenity and sociable. It must prioritize public transport, walking, and cycling. It must be biophilic. It must be circular. It must aim to be net zero in terms of carbon emissions. Now, this is a picture of Vancouver City. In 2021, I was stuck in Vancouver for eight months where my sons are living because of COVID-19. It's a really beautiful city. Every year, the Economist magazine publishes the list of the most beautiful cities in the world. Vancouver usually figures in the top three. And according to Vancouverians, it is the most beautiful city in Milky Way. And I didn't know it at that time. But I later found that there is a term called Vancouverism in city planning and architecture. It means developing what I said just now, all these things which I said for a climate resilient city. Between 1985 and 2010, Vancouver incorporated most of these points that I mentioned here, and it became a model city. Canada, for example, has three times the land area of India, and its population is only half of Tamil Nadu. So land is not a problem there. But still, the city planners of Vancouver realized that they should go vertical. And they went to the extent of saying the high-rise tower, where the high-rise towers should be, so that you don't block the view of the mountains and the sea and all that. And what you see, the green one there is a park, 200 square kilometers, uh, 200 acres park called Stanley Park. Nice bicycling heavily lanes, excellent for walking. You know, very well-designed city. 
Now, the interesting thing is this. The measures to mitigate the effects of climate change are also the measures to solve the problems of sprawl, traffic congestion, air pollution, water scarcity, degradation of rivers, lakes, urban and urban flooding, etc. A case of killing several birds with one stone. That is, if you try to solve your climate change problem, you are automatically solving all the other urban problems also. The good news is that this new vision has been demonstrated to be feasible. Almost every component of this new vision is already being implemented in India, here and there, on a small scale. You may say, after all, we are doing everything. As I said earlier, knowing is not the same as doing. You know? and, doing and sketchy, piecemeal and fragmented initiatives are not enough. We need a coherent strategy. It is necessary to transform these scattered initiatives into a national strategy. You may remember that the previous president, APJ Abdul Kalam, came up with a scheme, of course it never took off, called Pura, provision of rural amenities, urban amenities in rural areas. But I think the exact reverse is the correct thing. We should be providing rural amenities, community living, fresh air, lots of greenery in urban areas. That's what we should be doing. It is possible to do this through innovative city planning and design. Now, I told you the five issues there. I'll explain each one of them. First is city spatial form. Urban sprawl is bad. Urban sprawl is city growing horizontally rather than vertically. As you know, Chennai, I think on one side it may go up to Mahabalipuram, Bhanur, Pondicherry. Another side it may go up to Kanchipuram, Bhannur. Third side it may go up to Madhvit, you know, Ennur. The city goes like, keeps growing sideways like this. You are not going to be able to manage. Now, these mistakes were made by USA and Europe and other countries in the 1960s and 70s. A lot has been written about urban sprawl in those countries. We seem to be about 50 years behind the curve, and we are making all those mistakes now. And we don't seem to be doing any course correction. India's urban sprawl of both the US type and the China type. US type is low density sprawl, big compounds, one one or two story houses. China, you know, multi storied compound, both of sprawl. India has both types. Before automobiles came along, cities were compact. People used to walk or cycle or take a tram or a bus. They could reach all areas of the city in this manner. Once automobiles came along, people thought they could live in the suburbs. It says sprawl leads to private automobile dependency, longer commuting times, traffic jams, accidents, air pollution, poor health conditions. When I was vice chancellor, it used to take me one and a half hours to go from my university to my house and one and a half hours back. Three hours every day I spent in the car. It leads to loss of valuable agricultural land, water bodies, natural wetlands, floodplains, biodiversity. You know all this. The replacement of natural terrain with impervious surfaces, concrete, cement concrete and asphalt surface causes urban flooding. I'll come to this later. If you look out at any road, you will find it's completely impervious. You have concrete sidewalks on both sides. Then the asphalt road, there's no place for the water to go. So when it rains, there has to be a flood. Large areas are required for parking motorized vehicles. Provision of services like drinking water, sewerage, storm water drains, and public transit always lags behind a rapidly expanding city. If the city keeps going out like this, low density growth, you can't expect the, the corporation or the metro water to keep providing you all the services because low density growth, outward growth, is not conducive to provision of services. Low density urban sprawl increases the per user cost of provision of these services and renders it uneconomical for smaller localities. That's why even after 10 years or 14 years, you still, many of those arid areas still don't have water and sewage supply. But most, more important than all these, sprawl is bad from the point of view of climate change. It leads to higher greenhouse gas emissions and a greater carbon footprint. It's obvious because People will be using a lot of automobiles, a lot of commuting. Now, this is a famous study by the University of California, Berkeley, in 2014. It showed that carbon dioxide permissions, uh, sorry, emissions 
capita in the city core was much less and in suburban areas was much more. Suburban areas are shown as orange and red, city core in green. You will find that all the cities are green. Dense urban cores are green, the urban sprawl areas are red. In other words, suburban sprawl cancels carbon footprint savings of dense urban cores. If cities are to limit their carbon dioxide footprint, carbon footprint, and avoid the manifold problems associated with urban sprawl, they must grow vertically. The short point here is the 20th century urban planning template is no longer applicable to the 21st century. You can't grow outward. You have to grow vertically. You know, the vertical growth, we don't mean, we mean ultra high-rise buildings, not some 20 floors. I think even in Nerkundum, you have 20 floors now. We mean 50, 100, or even more stories high. It will call for streets of very great width to enable very high FSI, not possible in existing cities. If you give very high FSI, the existing city is going to collapse. I mean, it's already choking, it will choke now. So if you want to go high, then you have to go plan a new city. So there is a Government of India scheme for satellite cities, but I don't think much funding is there, and, and people are building the same type of cities again and again. We need to plan at least one new satellite city for each metropolitan city and at least two new satellite cities for each mega city. You know, don't say where is the money, money can always be found. As I said, instead of creating new districts, please create new satellite cities. We need to create satellite cities which are dense and vertical. You can't allow city to grow like this. At one time, for example, Delhi has now become 1,400 square kilometers. Bangalore is 740 square kilometers. Chennai is comparatively manageable 426 square kilometers. Imagine what level of Chennai is to 1,400 square kilometers. It will be unmanageable. Unlike the existing satellite cities which mimic the main city, the new satellite cities must be vertical and dense with a prescribed minimum and maximum density and FSI. You may have to prescribe a minimum density also. You don't want jokers putting up single storied houses and all that. You may have to prescribe a minimum density of FSI and also maximum FSI. So I'll just give the figures of maximum FSI in some cities. New York 15, Los Angeles 13, Singapore 25, Tokyo 20, Hong Kong 15. Greater Chennai Corporation right now is 426 square kilometers. We don't know the exact figures. The estimated population in the corporation limits is about 66 lakhs. The population density is about 15,500 per square kilometers. I am saying a well-planned ultra high-rise city can have double Chennai's population density. That is, you can have 30,000 per square kilometers because you are going to go really high. In which case, you can put up about 30 lakh people, more than Coimbatore, in a compact area of 100 square kilometers or 10,000 hectares. It would be about five times the area of Chennai's proposed Rundur Airport. It is doable. Of course, I don't think the same kind of resistance will be there for a new city, but you have to do it. If you just allow the city to grow the way it is doing, you are going to have serious problems. We should plan two satellite cities for Chennai and one satellite city each for Coimbatore, Madurai, Salem, and Trichy. It is wasteful to develop standalone film city, sport city, financial city, slum rehabilitation projects, etc. These should be integrated into the satellite cities. Housing needs of the LIG should not be should also be factored in. It can't be only for I mean it can't be a gentrified city. People of all age I mean income groups should be there. The vertical satellite city could be developed through a special purpose vehicle, SPV, with active private sector participation. I personally feel there's need to create an SPV to develop satellite cities, not just for Chennai, but for throughout the state. And this should be a major, I mean, initiative of the government. Now, you may say even the existing 10-foot, 10 10-story 10 or 20-story buildings are unlivable. What if a 50 story building or 100 story building be sociable and livable? Can an ultra high rise, high density building be livable and sociable? The answer is yes. It has been done elsewhere. I will tell you how. Provided it is multi layered, high amenity, and self contained, 
And two, there is extensive green infrastructure internally and externally so that the building approaches something like a natural environment. It should be mandated to have multiple ground levels at every 10th or 12th floor. That is, if there is a 100 floor building, every 10th or 12th floor should be left vacant and it should be treated like a ground level. The multiple, it should be called the multiple ground levels and that should be earmarked for civic amenities. The multiple ground levels of the towers to be connected by above ground walkways, just as you can walk around the towers at the ground floor. You should be able to walk around the 10th floor, around the 20th floor also. Now, there's an actual example here in Singapore, done by an architect firm called Woha. You know, they're very progressive architects. The building is called Skyville at Dawson. It's an award building. This one, ultra high rise, high density, high amenity building with multiple ground levels. I mean, you can see the I mean, every 10th floor or 12th floor is kept vacant. And this is how it looks. You know, there's a. Each of the multiple ground levels should have parks, gardens, library, gym, sports facilities, meeting halls, and other amenities. The units between two multiple ground levels will form a sky village or a locality. I mean, there's a sky village or a locality. The rooftop can serve as an urban farm. I mean, I'm not talking some airy fairy musings. These are things which have actually been done already. The rooftop can serve as an urban farm and the translucent canopy can be used to generate energy from solar power. Each building will be like a self-contained mini city within a city, minimizing the need for outside travel. Now, this is a rooftop, solar panels on the top and urban farm. Each building will be mixed use and will have housing, office space, commercial space, hotels, restaurants, malls, multiplexes, auditoriums, rainwater harvesting systems, wastewater recycling, plant and other services. Already you have some buildings like this. I mean, houses, offices, hotels, you know, things like this. Now this is going to be on a bigger scale. The economies of scale for energy production, rainwater harvesting, wastewater recycling, and to some extent urban farm will work only in the case of ultra high rise large buildings. This will not work with your 20 floor or 10 floor buildings. To be really economical, you need to go big, 50, 100 floors. Second point is how people move around. Transportation accounts for 25% of global greenhouse gas emissions. As you can see, cars are the biggest culprit followed by trucks and other freight, freight vehicles, then buses. The rail causes only 1%, shipping 10%, aviation 10%, others 1%. So buses, rail, public transit is always better. You know? Now, there's a famous saying by a gentleman called Enric Penalosa, the mayor of a city in South America. He said, an advanced city is not one where the poor move about in cars, but where even the rich use public transportation. I mean, we th in India, we think it is infradict to use public transportation. But in a really developed country, most people, including ministers, judges, you know, businessmen, they use the public transportation, the metro rail or the LRT or whatever. And I suppose you know what BRT BRT bus rapid transit is, bus will have dedicated lanes, nobody else, no other vehicle can go in that lane. Now this is Bangalore, world's sixth most congested city, average speed during rush hour is 18 kilometers per hour. There was a recent WhatsApp joke, somebody was saying, I want to sell my third, fourth and fifth gear, they are in showroom condition because they have never been used you know, of the car. Now in India, as per the National Family Health Survey 5, I mean, I would have preferred a survey based on uh, RTO records. Only 7.5% of Indian households own cars, 55% own a bicycle, scooter, or motorbikes. Even now, our roads are so crowded, but only 7.5% of the people own cars. In USA, the percentage is 90%. In Canada, it's about 85%. Most European countries, it's between 30 and 70%. 
Now, how are we going to, and new people are going on buying cars and motorcycles, at one time you are going to collapse, you know. Now, our, at present we are giving importance to cars, most importance to cars, less to public transport, then cycling and walking. It should be the other way around. It should exactly be the other way around. And there's, as you know, Indian cities aren't pedestrian friendly or cyclist friendly. 40 years ago in Coimbatore, I could cover any place by cycle or walk. Now you can't walk on Indian roads. You have to walk either before 6 a.m. or after 9 p.m. Otherwise, you'll get run over. And there are no zebra crossings for pedestrians. Even the traffic lights don't show pedestrian, they don't permit pedestrian crossings. I'm told that those type of traffic lights are costlier. So we don't take pedestrians at all. Money are away, no treatment are and those pedestrian crossings, which have been built, ugly structures, which have been built in several places, they're seldom used, you know, which shows that we give priority only to cars, not to pedestrians. Our infrastructure, our budgets also for pedestrian and bike infrastructure is negligible. Personal cars, the thing about cars is they're parked 90% of the time. 30 to 40 percent of all driving is usually the driver trying to find some parking place. You know, a lot of waste happens. Now you'll be surprised. Today, Denmark is considered a world leader in biking and walking. In 1967, a Dutch official declared, as I said just now, that cycling in Denmark was tantamount to suicide. But today, Denmark and Netherlands are leaders. Other cities in the developed world are also rolling back car centric planning. Cities and streets should be designed first for public transport, pedestrians, and cyclists, and then only for electric vehicles. So, the current thinking is streets don't belong to cars and motor vehicles, they belong to people. They are not meant only for movement, it's also for people to interact. And these are some headlines Danes dance in streets as Autobahn takes effect. I mean, can be done. Even now, for example, Holland, Netherlands has about 30% cars. Singapore's car light policy reduces car ownership to one third. In Singapore, there's a ban on cars. They're fixed number. Nobody, you can only buy within that number. I mean, somebody has to sell for you to buy. Amsterdam to cut 10,000 parking spaces by 2025 faces no serious pushback. Barcelona is reclaiming 1 million square feet from cars. Car-free zone should be the future of cities. Many European cities and American cities are declaring many zones as car-free, no cars here. I mean, like we have also done in a couple of places. Congestion pricing, London, Singapore, Stockholm, New York, New York is introduced. If you're coming to the city center, you'll have to pay congestion pricing. Then US, the one city where, you know, People can't manage without cars. Even there, a new locality has come up in Arizona where no cars are there, you know. So this is champs de the famous street in Paris, you know, that iconic street. Now they feel that the city, the street has been spoiled by cars. So they are going to redesign it, give multiple lanes for pedestrians and cyclists, and only a few lanes for cars. So the redesigned Shansabilisi is going to look like this. So these are the cities which have, which have good public transit. These are the cities which are most bicycle friendly. And these are the cities which are most walkable. And there is a website called walkscore.com in USA and Canada, which for each city and each neighborhood or locality, it tells you what is the transit score, bike score, and walkability score. Now, for example, you can see here, you can see even for neighborhoods, for example, Little Italy neighborhood in New York City, the walk score is 100. The transit score is 100, and the bike score is 94. Now, we don't have such systems at all in India. You know? And it is not enough if you simply provide a bike lane. It has to be protected bike lane. You know, otherwise, the, by, the by a cyclist will get run over by the cars. So there has to be protection for the bike, protection for the pedestrians. So it costs money, but people are doing this. 
you know, somebody will say there is no demand. There may not be any demand in India. There's a law in economics called Sayes Law, which says supply creates its own demand. Once you provide the cycling infrastructure, people will come. Once you provide the pedestrian sidewalks, people will come. I always say that Anna Nagar was planned in the 1970s. New York City was planned in the 19th century. New York City has such broad sidewalks. It has cycling lanes. And, you know, Anna Nagar, you can barely walk. Okay. Now, all these things are very difficult to do in the old city, but in the new satellite cities, we can implement all these ideas. Next, how the city's buildings are designed and constructed. We spend 90% of our time in buildings. Buildings alone are responsible for 38% of greenhouse gas emissions, 20% residential, 18% commercial, 11% in construction, 27% in operation. Building materials used in construction should have no embodied carbon. Embodied carbon means new. That material will have some will emit, I mean, the things which went in, the processes which went into making that material would have emitted some carbon dioxide. You compute all that and call it as embodied carbon. Using recycled materials and local materials can reduce the carbon footprint. Instead of procuring cement from Rajasthan, you should procure it from Chennai. The cement will travel less and there will be reduced carbon footprint. I'm getting confused between this one. Now, if you look at the embodied carbon, per cubic meter, you find that aluminum, surprisingly, has very high embodied carbon. Next is steel, even glass. So the other things have less. So we should go for those building materials which have less embodied carbon. A net zero energy building is one that has net zero energy consumption, producing as much solar or other renewable energy as it uses in a year. That means it doesn't depend on the Good, generally, it has its, it is self-sufficient in energy. Globally, there are 500 such buildings, commercial buildings, and 2,000 homes which are net zero energy. In India, there are seven net zero energy buildings. The Ministry Building of Pariyavaran Bhavan, the Ministry of Environment and Forests, it was built in UPA time, 2013. That's a net zero energy building. Now, this was the first net zero energy building built in USA in Colorado, in a very cold place, in 1982, it doesn't consume any energy. Its rooftop solar photovoltaic system produces more energy than it can use, you know. Now, this is a mosque in my native place, Kundapra. It's called Badri Juma Masjid. At least these guys have had the sense. They put up a mosque which is net zero. I mean, they have a windmill, they have a, sorry, so, solar and wind energy, and they meet their own needs. Now, we should think of such net zero buildings in Chennai, Tamil Nadu and Chennai. Now, this is an entire city in Germany, which is net zero. In fact, it's not only net zero, it produces four times more energy than it needs, the city of Freiburg. And as you see, this is the city hall, and the empaneling is not glass, it is solar panels. So, that city produces four times more energy than it needs. In India, we are trying to make Sanchi as the first solar city. Now, as you know, there has become a, this, a particular pattern of building in India. You have buildings, concrete buildings encased in glass, you know, they don't have any ventilation, natural ventilation. You have to use air conditioning, artificial lighting, high energy load, and the heat reflecting glasses have made the urban heat island effect even worse. So, the current thinking is that we should go revert back to the traditional Indian and Asian architecture. In the traditional houses, you will see there is an open courtyard and there are horizontal breezeways, vertical breezeways, and the house is naturally kept, you know, naturally lighted, naturally heated, naturally cooled. I recently went to Humayun's tomb in Delhi on a very hot day. I was surprised to find that inside Humayun's tomb it was very cold, cool, because there was natural ventilation. 
Now courtyards, I'll see the picture. She might have, you must be knowing it. Courtyard, you've seen this courtyards. I mean, many old houses are, even the central secretariat in Delhi has it. Atriums are covered. They are courtyards which are covered, but there is a lot of open space. Malls have atriums. The horizontal breezeways, the, the wind merely blows through the building. You know, the building will be cool. Your AC bill will come down by 20-30%. Vertical breezeways, the ant hill, the termite hill operates on that principle. That's why snakes go there, not only to eat the termites, but also to keep cool. If you do these four things, your AC load, current load, and lighting load will come down. Similarly, inverted skyline building, this is being done in Singapore. They are saying the building should be broader at the top and narrower at the bottom. And so that you can use the top for urban farming and solar, this one, and it provides shade for the people below. Sorry. And one unit thick apartments. One unit thick apartment, usually what happens in hotels and others, you have an, I mean, apartments on both sides, a corridor in middle. Whereas ideally you should have only one unit apartment so that they, they are exposed to the elements on at least two sides. You know? How biophilic the city is. As I said, biophilia is love of nature. We don't have proper data as to the amount of green cover in various Indian cities. That itself shows how little importance we're giving to greenery. Now, the best data I could get was State of Forest Report 2021. I don't think this is forest. No, it, what the report says is it treats all lands more than one hectare in area with a tree canopy density of 10% as forest cover. It includes urban forests, gardens, parks, orchards, avenue trees. According to the State of Forest Report, Mumbai has the maximum greenery, 25.4%, followed by Hyderabad, Delhi, Bangalore. Chennai is only 3.3%, mostly because of that Gindu Park and all that. Ahmedabad is 2%, Calcutta is 1%. And there is a city called Salem in Tamil Nadu, which I think must be having some 0.1% or something. I've been there in that city for two and a half years. There are no trees in that city. Very good city, actually. Now, this is the percentage of public green space in major cities of the world. Oslo, 68%. Vienna, 50%. Sydney, Nanjing, Hong Kong, Los Angeles, London. London is 35%. Barcelona, you know, Seoul, New York, 27%. Toronto, 13%, Paris, 10%. Now, Paris is somewhat low, but they have planned to increase it from 10% to 50% in the next 10 years. You know? And Singapore is already about 46%. They are planning to plant 1 million trees in the next 10 years. Now, I've always been interested in greenery, and I've told this story to some people. When I was in school, I had a lesson about the Kew Gardens of London. I was fascinated by the story. So when I was collector, I thought I would replicate Kew Garden in Villupuram. Yeah. Not all. And Kew Garden in London has one variety of every plant in the world. I thought I will have one variety of every plant in Tamil Nadu. And I, in that time, there used to be a program called Social Forestry, which was unfortunately wound up by government in 1996. So I planted that. And after the, I got transferred, the scheme was also wound up. I, I had lost all hope. But surprisingly, the forest survived. And thanks to Supriya Sahu, I got the... Drone shot of the plantation. Mm. This is about 400 acres, one acre for each variety. Neglected completely after 1996, but it has still survived. So the reason I'm telling this is, it is not that difficult. I mean, you can, people think putting up green trees is very difficult. The trick is to not to plant small plants. To six inch plants, or one inch, one foot plants or two foot plants, they will die. The trick is to plant seven foot to 10 foot tall plants. The initial cost may be more, but they will survive, you know.
Now, as I said earlier, when you live in an urban area, you suffer a urban health penalty, mental health penalty. Many people go nuts. And we have seen it during COVID when you're all the time inside the house, you go crazy. So you feel like going out, you feel like you know, walking, taking a walk in the park. When you feel bad, where do you want to go? You usually want to go to a park or a, go for a stroll or go to a beach or some things like this. So these are not, I mean, these are solid scientific papers published in Nature and things like this, which says urban greenery has a positive effect on both physical health and mental health. These are published papers, referred papers, which share that urban greenery has a positive effect on mental health. Now, this is Singapore. On the top left is a public government hospital. Look at the greenery there. Next is a primary school. Look at the greenery. Then you have a hotel. Then you have an office complex. I mean, they believe, Lee Kuan Yew, way back in 1960s, he realized that the best way to make Singapore an attractive destination for investors is to make it a green city and a beautiful city. More importantly, there are certain problems for which nature-based solutions are far superior to pure engineering solutions. Now, as I said, Chennai's corporation, they have 350 engineers to three horticulturists. We seem to think that gray infrastructure, that is engineering solutions, can solve all problems. They can't. There are some problems for which only nature-based solutions will work. I'll... For example, look at example one. Mangrove forests are much better at mitigating coastal land erosion, floods and tsunamis than sea walls and groins. Now you cut out all the mangrove forests and then you try to put up a sea wall or groins to prevent coastal erosion. That's very foolish. Example two, rainforests and other vegetation do a far better job of sequestration of carbon and for free than the expensive technology of capturing carbon directly from the atmosphere. As you know, to go to net zero, we have to suck carbon out of the atmosphere. The only known things we have at the moment, natural thing is the trees and plants. They absorb carbon dioxide and each tree sucks about 22 kilos of carbon dioxide per year. Now, there is also a technology called direct air capture, which can do the same thing, but that costs about $600 per ton. Now, if you know 51 million tons of carbon dioxide, so multiply 51 billion tons into 600, it comes to $30 trillion, that is the US GDP. Now, even if the cost were to come down to $100 per ton of carbon dioxide, multiplied by 51 billion, that is about $5 trillion, that is what India's GDP may be a few years from now. Example three, in its natural state, a river is usually clean, due to the densely vegetated corridor called riparian buffer on either side, which is usually interspersed with natural wetlands. Together, they filter out sediments, nutrients, pollutants, and clean as water through bioremediation. If you see any river in a natural state, it will be clean. And if you see on either side of that river, you will find a dense riparian vegetation, and you will find some natural wetlands. The natural wetlands serve as nature's sewage treatment plants, so the water going into the river will be clean, you know. Now, you cut all the trees, obviously the rivers are going to become dirty. Example four, this is a funda not many people know. Unscientific dredging and sand and gravel mining destroy the hyperoic zone, which is the river's liver. It harbors water filtering microorganisms that purify water naturally. It plays a critical role in recharging the groundwater table literally across large areas on either side of the river. Now, the hyperoic zone is between the groundwater and the stream, you know. That's a critical layer and that contains many naturally occurring microorganisms which can filter the water. The dirty water gets filtered. One, the riparian buffer filters the water, the hyperoic zone filters the water. Now, when you do sand mining, and the two stupid sand mining or dredging, all these things are lost. And this hyperoic zone is also useful for recharging the groundwater, you know. So both this buffer, this riparian buffer and hyperoic zone are responsible for recharging the groundwater. 
Now, our villagers instinctively know this. They may not know the science, but they know that sand mining causes water levels to go down. They all know this. That's why they keep protesting. So this is Chennai flooding, recent flooding. You've seen this. Now, as I said earlier, when the city expands horizontally, you will start paving more and more surfaces. Now, when our high courts and many other people think that flooding is because we have, you know, occupied erstwhile you know, tanks and low-lying areas. Even if you didn't occupy erstwhile tanks and all that, you will still have the urban flooding. This chart explains why. In a natural ground cover, when rain falls, 25% is shallow infiltration, 25% is deep infiltration, that is 50% of the water goes into the ground, 40% is evapotranspiration, only 10% is runoff. That is storm water runoff is only 10% in the natural, natural ground. 50% goes into the ground, which is the aquifer. Once you pave the road, pave the surface, either in the form of roads or sidewalks or whatever, Shallow infiltration becomes 10%, deep infiltration becomes 5%, evapotranspiration becomes 30%, runoff becomes 45%. Runoff increases from 10% to 55%. That is five and a half times. Groundwater recharge decreases from 50% to 15%. Comes down by 70%. And evapotranspiration also comes down. So once you build the surface, city surface, urban flooding is bound to happen. There is no escape. And it's not just because of the Eri, Giri, and Adhanal Matula. Urban flooding is essentially a problem of impervious surfaces. Studies have shown that for every 1% increase in impervious surface, annual floods increase by 3.3%. The conventional engineering solution is to convey the polluted storm water through expensive cement concrete drains to the nearest lakes, rivers, and canals, what you call storm water drains. Now, I've always been saying, and most of you know, that storm water drains are necessary but not sufficient. They're unsatisfactory. The recent floods in Chennai showed it. Why? Because, number one, city's terrain may not be even, may be highly uneven. And a city has several low-lying spots. Water can't go uphill, so it will collect in all those low-lying spots. And the water has to be disposed of to some lake, or river, or sea, or canal. Now, there are many areas which are far away from those places, so you are bound to have this problem, you know. Whatever you may do, you are bound to have this problem. So, so what do you do? So this, this picture shows here, that when you have natural cover, groundwater infiltration is 50% and storm water runoff is 10%. Without it, it's 15%, storm water runoff is 55%. So that is the funda. You need to supplement. You definitely need storm water drains, but you need to supplement it with green infrastructure. Green infrastructure is just a fancy term for trees, trees, parks, and all other things. Green infrastructure reduces the extent of impervious surfaces and increases the area of absorbent land. Either panname ning a flood the avoided panumbia. Even then there will be floods, but at least it will be less. It slows down, soaks up, filters, and stores rainwater where it falls as much as possible. Now, green infrastructure, now as I said, space is at a shortage in cities. You can't so you have to fit in greenery wherever possible. This is green roofs. Many cities in the world have green roofs. Chicago was the first to do it. Toronto has mandated that any building with more than 2,000 square meters built up area must put up a green roof. This is last corner. Sorry. No. Sorry, I'm getting confused with this and that. <laughs> the last corner is a university in Indore called Prestige University. They also are having green roofs. Next, you have green walls. The top left is the first green wall in the world. It's in Paris, built by a guy called Eric Blanc. It's near, you know, Eiffel Tower. It's as much of an attract tourist attraction as the Eiffel Tower. The bottom right is Bangalore's latest airport, Terminal 2. You know, they have a green wall. These are simple things like medians. You should throw out all those ugly concrete medians. To, you know, planted boxes like this. 
bounce wheels, nothing but a fancy term for a ditch. I mean, don't pave. The moral of the story is allow the water cycle to move naturally, stop paving. Now, if you look at the average corporation of Chennai Park, 50% of the area is paved. You know, these are rain gardens and constructed wetlands. See, natural wetlands are there by the side of the river or the sea. Most of them have been lost. Now, you have to replace them with constructed artificial wetlands, avenue trees, then parks and gardens, pocket parks in places like Netherlands, many places in Europe. They have closed many small streets and they converted them into parks. They said car in the and, uh, you know, park company. So there are a lot of pocket parks. The funda is if the park is more than 100 meters or away. People won't go. They will feel lazy to go. So the park should be as close to you as possible. Urban forests. There are plenty of lands, you know, open space reservation areas in Chennai city, which are lying idle. They should all have been forested. The open space land. So there should be, there should be a massive program of forest, forestation. Please. And the video clip. Huh? Well, Susan, plenty, plenty of dependence today, especially on the lot of residential drop payment funding systems. This is the first time there's a top mix of funding program. So, yeah, quite a bit of experiences in funding materials at all. Top mix funding materials is so good of the way it can go with the world for such a quick amount of time. I still experience a ten rainfall days. So, these are what are called permeable payments. You've got porous concrete, porous asphalt, you know. Normally, concrete is porous. The non porous are not special. But the porous are not. Then, underground storm water walls in low lying areas, you have to temporarily store the water to prevent peak flows. Yeah. Now, as I said earlier, we have completely neglected green infrastructure in India and in Chennai also, green infrastructure is multifunctional. It increases the sequestration of carbon. The only thing which sucks carbon out of the atmosphere is trees and plants. It reduces storm water runoff, protects water bodies from storm water and agricultural pollution, increases infiltration to the aquifers, reduces the heat island effect, lowers heating and cooling energy costs, cleanses the air, improves citizens' health and well-being, provides relaxing amenity spaces, offers opportunities for startups, generates a lot of employment for skilled and unskilled labor. Actually, we can do this through NREJ in villages and then bring them and plant the things in the cities, you know. Provides habitats for animals and birds, beautifies the city, increases the property values. There are so many advantages. Now, gray infrastructure projects like storm water drains are large scale, expensive and publicly funded interventions. Green infrastructure is mostly small scale, decentralized. Individuals can do it. Rotary clubs or service clubs can do it. And companies can do it. Since nearly 60% of a city's area is likely to be privately owned, roping in non-government players is crucial. For government to panna patade, you have to rope in private players. Three Chennai rivers are dead. Nothing can bring them back to life. Is a news item, recent news item. I don't know if you remember this picture. This is Shivaji Ganeshan's song, Nan Anupodh Kadidamalla. This is Kuhn River in 1965. Two things you notice. Though it's black and white, the river is thoroughly clean. Otherwise, you won't be sitting in a boat there and singing. And number two, you notice that there are dense vegetation on both sides of the river. I told you earlier, for a river to be clean, there must be a dense riparian vegetation on both sides. The moment the riparian vegetation goes, your river goes. The test of success of river restoration is the return of thriving aquatic life to a river that was once biological death. All the three Chennai waterways are dead. You'll be surprised to know that London Thames River in 1850 was dead, was exactly like this. In 1850s, it was stinking so much that the parliamentary sessions had to be adjourned several times. In 1957, Thames was declared biologically dead. The Rhine River passing through Germany and Netherlands, that was declared dead. The Suzhou Creek passing through Shanghai was declared dead. Singapore's, you know, 
Singapore River and Kalang River were declared dead. All these have since been restored to life. Actually, Tamil Nadu was a pioneer. DMK government 1967 was another year. Home restoration, 2.2 crores were sanctioned in 1967. Right now, works are going on for about 2,500 crores. But we have not been able to succeed. Because this is not an easy thing. It will require sustained hard work. Lee Kuan Yew took 10 years to restore a river which is 3.2 kilometers long and 10 kilometers long. Chinese government took 40 years to restore the Suzhou Creek. The Rhine River also took 40 years. Thames River, it took 50 years. So these are long standing projects. Nammalangilala, Nigula, long sustained Panamudi Mangarade, doubt it. Now, when you talk of the river restoration, you must be aware that there are two types of sources. One is point sources, and another is diffuse sources. Point sources are industrial pollution and sewage. These you can identify. Other is diffuse sources, storm water runoff, agricultural runoff. Either When a river is flowing, a river doesn't come only passes only through city, Chennai city. It comes from some village, passes through several villages and several small towns. Varapu has polluted already. The agricultural runoff, industrial, is a long So, we have a mistake in Chennai. We are focusing only on the stretch of the river within Chennai city. Adiyar River, for example, about 15 kilometers in Chennai city, 42.5 kilometers overall. Koum is about 18 kilometers in Chennai city, 72 kilometers overall. And the Miri 54 kilometers, Strachila already polluted. If you are doing, you should do for the entire river. You know, you should put up the riparian buffer along the whole river. Then, yeah. And there's no point in putting parks and all the parks, bamboo plantations, you have to put only native vegetation, which has got deep roots. You know? So the last point that we are touching is how circular the city's economy. Circular economy means you recycle, reuse the city's waste. The existing economy is called linear economy. You take materials, make and waste. You dump the waste, either you burn the waste or you put it in a landfill. The circular economy says take, make, reuse, share, repair, replenish, recycle. This is circular economy. Now, this is the various types of waste that you typically find. A circular economy is one that doesn't throw waste products away, but recycles, repairs, or reuses them or recovers raw materials from them. A fully circular city can cut down resources used by 28% and greenhouse gas emissions by 72%. The need for land is also reduced. Segregation at source is the key, not easy. Number solar segregate, but it's not very easy. Now, as you know, there are various types of waste. You have organic waste. You will be surprised to know, even in poor countries, about 20% of the food is, sorry, rich countries, about 40% of the food is wasted. Poor countries, 20% of the food is wasted. When I say wasted food, I don't mean wheat waste, but not only kadala in the supermarket level waste. So, and waste, food waste itself contributes about 6% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's atrocious. Hmm? So, organic waste can be used for making compost, fertilizers, biogas. Construction waste can be used for making sand, can be broken down and aggregates or metal for construction. Glass waste can be converted into sand. Steel, copper, aluminum, and zinc can be recovered from the waste in near 100% purity. Plastics, rubber, leather, wood, and packaging materials can be used as fuel. Now, there's a new funder called Product Test Service, PAAS model. I had some discussions with Mr. Kartigan and Murugananda also yesterday. It Philips of Holland has now changed its name to Signify. What they are saying is, we will not sell light equipment here after, we will only lease it to you. For your house or office or something, we will install the lights. In on Pusa problem. The advantage here is the in the present system, segregation of the waste is a problem. 
in the European Union, they want to make the manufacturers responsible for taking back the waste and reusing it. They are bringing the regulation saying that it shall be the manufacturer's job to take back the waste. So this, for example, Corporation of Chennai or all municipalities in Chennai, they may use this service for street lighting, for air conditioners, refrigerators, all electronic goods are work in the system. Europe is the Headphones, phones, it's called product as service. You don't give the product, they only lease the product, they take the product back. You know, even headphones are used like that. Video. Did you know that used glass containers can be made into sand? One company will pick up your glass products and turn them into sand that can help rebuild Louisiana's coast. Yes, sand. Let that sink in for a minute. Glass Hat Full is a grass root recycling program in New Orleans that takes glass, food, and beverage containers that would typically end up in the landfill and converts them to soft sand mixture, which is then used to rebuild coastlines, prevent floods, and support eco-friendly construction. To do this, the company collects glass bottles and products through free drop-off clubs and curbside pickup. The glass then arrives at a processing facility where the company sorts it by color and removes any caps. Next, the glass is polarized, sorted, and separated, and then it's ready to be bagged and used for various projects. Then to University students Max Seitz and Francisca Trotman begin. Basically, the point is sorry, that you can recover sand. As you know, bottles are made of glass. I mean, glass bottles are made of sand. You can get back sand. So, the manal is the one that is Now, the point is there is a solid business opportunity here. You know, there is a lot of agricultural waste in the form of crop residues. As you know, Delhi's Air pollution problem is because of the crop burning in, crop stock burning in Punjab, Haryana and all that. Now, ideally, I mean, those things should be bought from the farmers, paying some value and used to produce biofuel. Now, if you biofuel, can actually crop land and divert and biofuel grow. Whereas, you have already a lot of agricultural waste lying around all over the country and there is a I mean, recently, Prime Minister inaugurated one first biofuel production company from crop stocks. I think Tamil Nadu and Mapanla. And all this urban waste, municipal waste, in the Nare products, Pandla. As I said, glass, you can convert it into sand. And I think our industrial policy should be reoriented towards these kind of initiatives also. Now, this is municipal solid waste recycling worldwide. The highest is only. I think Slovenia about 58%. But India is a different country. But India is a different country. But India is a different country. And along, till now I was talking about solid waste. You also have liquid waste. You know? And only 28% of urban wastewater is treated. The balance 78% is disposed of in rivers and lakes. That is Yamuna River. You can see how it is. Next year. Dal Lake in Srinagar, that is Bilandur Lake in Bangalore, Bilandur Lake in Bangalore, which actually burned once, you know, and this is a Khom River. This is Chennai's day zero, you are all aware of this. Now, in 2018, Nuti Ayo came up with a report saying India is facing its worst water crisis in history. 21 cities are at risk of running out of groundwater. Chennai, Bangalore and all these cities were included. Now, basically, if you take Chennai, we have only four sources of water. Surface water, 83%. Groundwater, 2%. Desalination seawater, 11%. Reclaimed wastewater, 4%. You'll be surprised to know, as I told you in the case of, I mean, uh, river restoration, another began it in 1967, 10 years before Singapore did it. Tamil Nadu did wastewater reclamation in the 1990s, a small plant in Chennai. Singapore and Israel did it only after 1995. We did it before them, but we never really progressed in a big way. Similarly, Tamil Nadu started its first desalination plant, a 10 MLD plant at Ramnathapuram in 96 or 97. Singapore, Israel did it along with us. Now they have gone much further. So as you can see, surface water and groundwater contribute 85%. Desalination water and reclaimed water, 15%. Surface water can limit 
we have reached the limit ground water poche surface water illa we are now in a hijacking water from rural areas and bringing them by tankers here that will not go very far so the only two sources a deal desalination of sea water and reclamation of waste water the only two sources available that are climate independent and elastic their combined share of chennai as i said right now it is 85% according to me napa according to me in 2030 the waste water convert reclamation of waste water should go up from 4% to 10% desalination should go up from 11% to 20% ground water and surface water should come down and by 2060 waste water and desalination should go up even more surface water and ground water should come down if you don't plan for like this then you are going to have a serious problem because there are practical limits to how much surface water you can get and how much waste water you can, sorry how much ground water you can get the only two available sources are desalination of water and reclamation of waste water about 80 to 90% of the water we use becomes waste water reclamation is a long term solution for the water crisis also a must for health and environmental reasons only reclaimed waste water should be mandated for non potable uses in industries construction landscaping hotels hospitals large apartment blocks but drinking water poi construction ki use pandrunga toilet ki use pandrunga garden ki use pandrunga adikkala potable non potable water da use panna solrunga sustain public education to overcome the yuck factor people don't like this reclaimed water so both singapore and israel enna pandranga sustain public education they have done that so i'll come to the last part of my lecture just like fsi there's a funda called green plot ratio fsi is built up area divided by plot area green plot ratio is green area divided by plot area now in singapore they mandated green plot ratio must be at least 100% nee oru acre land edute adla building potiyana one acre at least one acre green tree irukanum epdi roof la podreyo wall la podreyo epdi podreyo ningal theriyar but irukanum Germany they prescribed about 30 percent. Namala is open. Some country, different countries are prescribing different levels. Singapore is very stringent. They are prescribing minimum 100 percent. Next is what is called community plot ratio. As I said, vertical buildings can be unlivable unless you provide amenities. And provide amenities, I said you multiple ground levels. Every 10th floor or 12th floor should be left vacant for provision of amenities. Are they? so and the mari amenities at the area of community space provided divided by area of the plot is called community plot ratio next is self sufficiency index is a measure of the building's capacity to produce its own energy food and water i already told you some buildings have produced 100% of energy they are also producing more energy than they require now the taller the bigger the building i told you they can produce their own energy their own food own water i mean by recycling waste water they can do it so this is a measure of how much the building is able to do it the last is carbon footprint of the building now peter drucker said what gets monitored gets done now, unless you monitor yetra carbon dioxide emission agude what is the carbon footprint of each building when you buy something you find in the box a list of ingredients sometimes list calories of those energy of those ingredients in well a future la and mari varum i mean if you are putting in a building building constructing a building people will say how much embodied carbon that building contains what kind of materials are used i think cmd and all should start working in this direction now i'll just show you a few examples done in singapore many others have done it i'm giving the singapore example because singapore is closest to us in terms of you know climate and other things what has newton suits sweets singapore green plot ratio 130% that is area land area or the plot area or 130% green tree provide panirukanga community plot i mean plot ratio is 90% of course water 60% energy zero food zero next who has park royal and pickering hotel in the green plot ratio is 240% that is 240% of green tree community plot ratio is 150% so much of amenities they have provided water 65% energy 1% food 0% next 
This is Oasia downtown Singapore. Here, green plot ratio is 1,110%. 11 times the plot area is greenery. Community plot ratio is 300%. Water 60%. Energy zero. Food zero. This is, you might think Singapore they have done it in Dhaka also. Brack University, Dhaka. Green plot ratio 130%. CPR 25-250%. Water 20%, energy 25%, food 0%. We have done a building in Mumbai also. But details are not so The last slide is vision of a city of the future. This is how a future city is going to look like. It'll, as I said, it will be high rise, dense, multi layered, you know, lot of greenery. It will produce its own food. It will produce its own energy, it will produce its own water, it will have zero carbon impact. Thank you. Okay. One, one last you, point I would like to say, please, please don't think I'm saying this to save the planet. Planet is going to be fine. We are doing this to save ourselves, you know. The planet has been around for 4.6 billion years. It has survived meteorite strikes, comet strikes, volcanoes, magnetic pole reversals, everything possible under the sun. The planet will be there for another 4.6 billion years or more. It is humans who are in danger. Yes. This, uh, sir is going to be here for some time in case after the meeting you can ask him. In the interest of time, we have to bring this meeting to an end. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ashok Vadan Shetty for this wonderful, uh, meticulously researched uh, lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the building in the building. It's a homecoming for you. And I also want to thank one and all of you for attending this uh, lecture. Um, I also want to thank Dr. R. Magum, uh, not only for suggesting him and also to bring him here. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so, I have an announcement to make. So this will be probably the last meeting we are having in this building now. Um, because the Roja Mutia Research Library has taken an initiative to create the Tamil Knowledge Campus, which is going to come up in another two years. And in the meantime, the government has been very kind enough to give another alternate space in the same road opposite uh, Emma Swaminathan Foundation. We'll be functioning there from the next month, and we are shifting the entire library there. So all of you are welcome to come and uh, make use of the collection and its services in that uh, building. And uh, we'll keep you in fact, just in case if you're coming here for the first time, please leave your phone number, email address so that we can get in touch with you, let you know about our programs. I also want to especially thank uh, officers who have taken the time to come and attend this lecture. Thank you once again. Have a nice evening.